title of my sermon this morning is What We Believe. Well, it, the series is What We Believe. We have this most Januaries and Februaries uh, where we look at doctrine. We look at theology behind our major beliefs, so they're, they're formal beliefs. And we'll talk a little bit more about what theology is in a moment. We're going to be looking at the doctrine of the church. Just what is church? What's the intention of church? And today we're going to say, who is the church? And that will make more sense as we go through. Now let me make some attribution, uh, attribute it appropriately. The background, most of, a lot of my sermon comes from uh, Wayne Grudem's systematic theology. There are places where I am lifting, you know, off his work and pasting it to the PowerPoint uh, I'm using a lot of his structure and things, so be be alert to that. Um, in, I know we generally don't worry about those kind of things, but but and most of the time, 98% of my sermons uh, come out of my head and out of the Bible. Uh, but but this series, I'm using his background, his his organization uh, to bring things. The main idea of the sermon today is going to be the church is the community of all true believers for all time. And that'll make sense as I go through. Um, teaching theology is different than a normal sermon. A normal sermon, what I, my preferred method of preaching is to get a Bible passage. And, and we are in... Uh, the book of Luke right now, we, we've gone through about eight or nine chapters, I believe, in Luke. Uh, my hope is after our, this series to continue on through Luke. And I really prefer to be that way. Um, I, I really think good preaching reflects the Bible. Um, and I think bad preaching reflects the preacher. And so I like for... The author, Luke, who was inspired by God with the truth that we needed to hear to be the one that steers what you hear on a Sunday morning. And I'm just the one that kind of organizes that and gets a, a chunk of that that we can manage and then tries to make it clear. Uh, with a theology, a theology, rather than going down the page, you gather lots of scriptures together and say this is a big belief that we have based on these passages. So just, and so my method of teaching, um, uh, preaching through this doctrine is gonna be a little bit different. Normally I try to make a unit each Sunday, a manageable unit, a bite that we can chew you know, in one, in one sermon. Most likely I will be more, I will go down to the page and when we get to a, a time limit, I'll stop. And so if, if I am preaching through these things and abruptly stop, it's because I'm going by the clock rather than by trying to make a, a unit. And so usually with a unit, I try to have a beginning, middle, and end. Uh, I, may, I may not do that so much. Uh, and it may seem a little bit arbitrary. So just be aware of that. Now, several definitions. What is theology? You hear that term. It's the study of the nature of God, basically. And as part of that, because we're human beings and the way anything we do connected with God becomes a religion. Religion is action. Um, unless you're just sitting around contemplating, even that can be a religion, but everything else we do is religion. So religious belief becomes a part of theology, but it's the study of God. It's trying to collect information from whatever source and get an idea in your head who God is. Um, and, it, and it's from the Greek word theo in Greek, theos is God, and logos is the wisdom, the word, the philosophy, uh, the study of. So the study of God uh, is what theology is. Now we, as evangelical Christians, we prioritize the scripture. And we, we get things from other places too, but those things are very secondary. Those are nuances to what we believe. The core of what we believe is collecting scriptures. Um, theology is made up of doctrines. So you just defining some of these terms, 
Uh, what is a doctrine? Well, a, a doctrine is a belief. Basically, it is what you believe about something. It is a belief or set of beliefs taught, uh, um, held and taught by a church. In this case, um, Christianity, subset of Christianity, evangelical Christianity, uh, which is much more Bible-oriented, Bible-centered, um, then there are parts of Christianity that are more tradition-centered. Um, and that would be more focused on the way that this um, uh, group has always done things and always believed. Um, as evangelical Christians, we're more concerned about the inspired text of the scripture for forming our belief system. But lots of groups have doctrines. Um, I've been reading about World War I, uh, and it is fascinating when you begin looking at, and, and that, well, that was a mess, um, World War I. There were a lot of military doctrines that the different nations had that were impractical, and they made a mess of things. Then it Todd, it was just, you know, the immovable object and the irresistible force, they were all irresistible uh, objects and inanimate forces and all. It, it was a mess because they had doctrines. They had a set of beliefs. The French, for example, believed you should, you should attack, attack, attack. The technology had gone way past the attack uh, and they just, they just, their men were mowed down. Um, but in order to get to, to get progress through the French military, you could not be a defensive minded person because the doctrine was attack. So if you said, well, this is not a good situation to attack in, they'd say, we're not gonna promote you. It was just a mess. Anyway, a doctrine is what you believe about things. And so you get a lot of different doctrines. For example, the doctrine of who God is, the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine we're looking at, the doctrine of the church is a set of beliefs. When you put all those doctrines together, you have a theology. Uh, doctrines are also built on philosophies. It's very important to understand. And, and philosophy is a study of the fundamental nature of knowledge. Why you think what you think about something. Uh, it is the fundamental nature of reality. Are we really here? Are we, or is this the matrix and are we in a pool of ooze and you know just imagining all this? somewhere, uh, and the nature of existence. Uh, all those things go into philosophies. Philosophies go into making doctrines. And, and I don't want to get too out there, too esoteric in the, in the way I talk, but everything you think is the product of philosophy. You don't have any, you don't have any view that is not a philosophy. Uh, and what is very important is for a person that wants to understand themselves is to understand where your philosophies come from, why you think the things you think that are important. Um, and so for us as evangelical Christians, I've already said, we are Bible centered. We believe the Bible is inspired by God, that God is communicating to mankind the truth. And so correctly, we want to have philosophically a biblical worldview, a belief that before there was anything, there was God and God created everything and he created it intentionally, He created it with a direction that he is working a plan, that God is alive and well and working a plan right now. And when we interact with God's written will, we see scripture come true for over a thousand years, for, for 1500 years, the Bible said there will be a baby born and he will be the son of God. We can look back historically and say that has happened. We live in a biblical worldview. So kind of everything we're going to be doing in this What We Believe series and really everything we do every Sunday, I believe correctly done is giving a biblical worldview to reality. We look at What's going to happen? What's happening in our world? What may happen Monday morning? And we view it as God would view it. That's a biblical worldview. All right?
So what is the nature of the church? I'm giving you the main idea uh, again as the definition. The church is the community of all true believers for all time. And we're going to define these terms more. This, this definition understands that the church is to be made of all those who are truly saved. And one, the way you may see that is when we people come to be members of the church, they come on a profession of faith or a letter from another church that they are born again. Now, why is that important? Um, in some ways, that may not be that important um, because, you know, uh, born again people don't necessarily act all that much better than unsaved people. They should, but they don't always do it. The real reason is we do not want our membership to be unsaved and take the church in a direction other than the God's will and, and biblical will. And so it is a very important thing uh, for people that vote, that make the big decisions in our church to be born again. Let's look at some scripture who makes up the church. In Ephesians, Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, chapter 5, verse 25, he said, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And so that term church, it's uh, uh, ecclesia in Greek, and we'll see that term throughout this, is used to apply to all those Christ died to redeem, all those who are saved by the death of Christ. We say the born again, that's a biblical term, uh, also uh, Born, of, born from above is a variation of that term. We say the believers, uh, and by that we mean those who are born again. And the big technical term is regenerate Christians. Now, we went, when we went through Luke and looked at the different, uh, the, the parable of the seeds, uh, we talked a lot about what it means to be a regenerate Christian. Let me just give you a quick Bible gospel, I say ABC. These are the steps. When we say the gospel, this is what we mean. Step number one, A in ABC, is accept responsibility for your sins. There is no salvation for a per possible for a person that does not think that they are guilty of sin. You cannot be saved. If you ever hear a person, the catchphrase is, I'm a pretty good person. If you hear somebody saying, I'm a pretty good person, they are not accepting responsibility for their sin. They're not. They're trying to make an excuse. I'm good enough. Aren't we all equal? Well, the answer is yes, we are all equal. You know what equalizes us? It's sin. We're all sinful. Nobody is more deserving of God's love or mercy than anybody else. Romans 3.23, it just says it. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You have to accept that about yourself. That's not a New Testament um, idea. Going all the way back to a rather philosophical book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 7.20. Indeed, there's not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. And so it's not about our goodness or badness. It's about God's holiness. And so God is our standard. Jesus, who came and never sinned, that's who we compare ourselves with, not with one another. We're equal. We're equal. Nobody deserves to be with God. God is too holy. And in fact, if you have sinned when you approach the throne of grace, God is so holy that he will zap you if you've got sin. You have to be sinless to go to heaven. Now, I, I jumped ahead there. That's that's. Only Jesus can take away that sin so you can be sinless to go to heaven. Let's continue here. A couple more verses. In Galatians 3, 22, scriptures declare us all prisoners of sin, all people. So we receive God's promise of freedom from this bondage of sin only by believing in Jesus Christ. Now that forecasts the next uh, part B in the ABC, but... Uh, Romans 1.20 says, For since creation, God's attributes are clearly seen, so they, being mankind, are without excuse. 
Nobody can say, I did not know. Man is without excuse because of our sinfulness. So that's A of the gospel. Uh, uh, one more. 1 John 1, 8 through 10. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to Jesus, if we accept responsibility for our own sinfulness, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness so that when we stand before God in judgment, we are innocent. And that's at the end of time. Uh, if we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing his word has no place in our heart. So step number one, accept sin. And I meant to put in here, I forgot to put in, uh, talking about the necessity of being born again uh, for being in the church and for church membership. You know, Paul also says that to people who are not saved, the gospel is foolishness. But for those that believe, it is the power to save. And so that's, that's why we don't want our church, when if we vote on something important, we don't want people that believe the gospel is foolishness to be making the decisions for the direction of our church. So I, I needed to put that in earlier. All right, so step, step number one, A, is accept responsibility for your sin. Step two, that has already been talked about a little bit, believe Jesus is the only way to God. This is a hill to die on. This is absolute part of the gospel. If you entertain other pathways, then Jesus is a liar to you. And you can't get saved uh, through Jesus if you think other way, there are other pathways to God. Can I say it any plainer than that? Acts 12, uh, 4, 12, there is salvation in no one else. This is Peter at Pentecost talking about Jesus. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. I don't have much to add to that. Jesus himself said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I have nothing to add. Number three, our ABC, the C is commit. Now, the first two in the ABCs of the gospel, the first two are actually the two easy steps. I think intellectually, we can accept that we are sinful and it fallen short of the glory of God. I think... Lots of people believe that Jesus is the only way to God, but that's only two-thirds of the way. Um, the step number three is you have to commit your life to Jesus. Surrender. I am gone. Now I am Jesus' man. The old Rex is dead. The new Rex, the born-again Rex, is committed to Jesus' purposes, whatever that means. And that's varied. Um, you know, I, I often say um, it's not what you do that's so important as why you do it. Are you doing it in order to honor God? That's committing your life to him. Your goals and purposes uh, submit themselves, surrender to Jesus' purposes. And you have to commit. You have to make a commitment to put Jesus first in order to be saved. Uh, and we can live a life accepting and believing and not committing. And it's very dangerous. It's a very dangerous place. A-B is not the gospel. A-B-C is the gospel. And the go-to verse, Romans 12, 1 and 2, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is extra. It doesn't say that. It says, which is your reasonable service, which is your baseline. Giving your life back to Christ at salvation is the reasonable service, the baseline service. And then it goes on to say, do not be conformed to this world. Now, that's a challenge, isn't it? It was a challenge when I was young. 
it was a challenge when it's always been a challenge to not conform to the world, the secular physical world, to not make the priorities that are common to all people your priorities. I think it's harder today. I think the ante is up. I, I hate to surrender anything to young people, but I think they have a tougher time than I had um, not conforming. There's so much pressure to conform to the world. There is so much pressure. There is indoctrination. It's, it's horrible. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know what? How do you renew your mind? You read the Bible and you pray. Be transformed by the, your knowledge of Scripture, your knowledge of God, so that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's the gospel. Now, the next step Christ is the authority over the charge. So great is the plan for the charge in God's big plan. When he spin the planet into orbit, he had this plan. He said, I must exalt Christ to the position of the highest authority in the charge. So when we make decisions as a charge, our goal is to make the decision that Jesus would make if he was standing here. Every decision, from the biggest to the smallest, what does Jesus want to happen? In Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, he, God, has put all things under Christ's feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is Christ's body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So Jesus is the head over the body. We are the body of Christ. Jesus has ascended. He is in heaven. We are his hands and feet. And our goal as a church is to do what Jesus would do if he was here in physical presence among us. That last phrase is, is interesting and it is debated. But the fullness of him who fills all in all Fullness means uh, the accomplishment. It has happened. Uh, we, it was his intention for, for the church to be here and do his work. Uh, it is Jesus who does the good, the ultimate good, but we are the one, his hands and feet as he does it. So, for example, when we have heart life and we give people food, um, it is Jesus who does the good through that. We are doing our part. We are part of his uh, hands and feet. And when we deviate from doing that food ministry in the way that Jesus would do it if he is here, then we're doing it for ourselves and not for him. And it, just as one example. So he is the full, uh, the, we are the body, which is God's intention, and it is Christ who does good through what we do if we are doing it correctly. Jesus Christ himself builds the church by calling people to himself. Again, it's not us who builds the church, though we have a part to play in that. Uh, it is Christ himself. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus promised, I will build my church. And again, that is why we want, uh, in our membership, we want born-again people, because we want the church that Jesus is building, not the human institution or community that we can build. Um, Luke adds, the church growth came not by human effort alone. We have our part to play, as I said, but in Acts 2, this again is Pentecost, it says, the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. It is a divine thing. Uh, that we are seeking to be a part of. Now, this was interesting, and I, and I found this very informative. You know, I'm an Old Testament guy, uh, but a lot of this was very fascinating to me. The church is an Old Testament pattern. Now, we have 
nuanced it and we have built culture around it. Uh, we are uh, definitely New Testament oriented, but this is the same pattern that was established in the Old Testament. So follow me with this. Uh, this process by which Christ builds the church today is just a continuation of God's Old Testament pattern for calling people to himself to be a worshiping assembly before him. Now, I could go into great, we could, we could go into Old Testament salvation and spend a lot of time uh, doing that. Basically, salvation has always been about faith. Uh, is God and his plan first and foremost? Are you committed? Do you accept responsibility for your sin? Do you believe that God is, uh, for us, now that Jesus has come, that Jesus is the only way? before Jesus came, that God is providing a way, and then you commit your life to it. It's always been basically the same. And that's, if that's not satisfying to you, you know, contact me and we'll, we'll discuss it. And I'm sure that I can come up with several hours uh, of discussion on that subject. But let's just say it, leave it there for now. The Old Testament indicates that God thought of his people as a church, an ecclesia. A people assembled for the purpose of worshiping God. Go back to Moses. Moses tells Israel as they stood on the bank of the Jordan getting ready to go in. In Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 10. Gather the people to me. This is God talking through Moses. That I may let them hear my words. So that they may learn to fear me. And this is that respectful fear. That good respectful fear. All the days that they live upon the earth. In the old Greek Septuagint, that was in 200 BC, they began translating from Hebrew into Greek. That version of Deuteronomy 4.10, the Hebrew word for gather, which is kahal, translates to the Greek verb ekklesiazo, ekklesiazo, to summon an assembly is what that word means. That term is used in the New Testament as ekklesia, church. So it's not surprising since they use the same word. Most of the New Testament authors probably read the Greek version of the Old Testament. Uh, can speak of the Old Testament people of Israel as a church. For example, when we get to Acts, we see Stephen. Stephen does a great job. Go back and read Stephen as he kind of sums up the Old Testament and how the Old Testament becomes the cross and Jesus uh, Stephen speaks of the people of Israel in the wilderness as the ecclesia, the church. You'll see it translated in Old Testament as the assembly, but it is the same word that we would use in the New Testament for the church of God's people. For example, he said this in Acts chapter 7, verse 38. Moses was with our ancestors, the church or assembly of God's people in the wilderness. In Hebrews chapter 2, and Hebrews is a wonderful book for what I'm talking about right now because the author of Hebrews is targeting Israelites, the Jews, who are wanting, who have become Christians and then wanted to leave, have become a part of the, the church and then want to leave and go back to Judaism. And so it really does a good job of showing uh, the interaction. But in chapter 2, verse 12, Christ says, I will declare your name, God's name, to my brethren in the midst of the ecclesia, the assembly or the church in heaven. I will sing praise to you. Now he is quoting there Psalms 22, 22. Thus Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, the author of the book of Hebrews understands Christians today, the church here on earth, to be surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. That's in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1. It says, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. This reaches back into the Old Testament, mainly to the Old Testament. It includes Abel all the way back at the beginning of Genesis, Enoch, who was no more, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. And you can see that in Hebrews chapter 11. All these Old Testament witnesses surround us today as we sit here as we act in faith 
as we interact with the divine, there is a great cloud of witnesses, according to the Bible, in heaven, reaching back to the Old Testament, that are pulling for us, that want us to do right, that are a part of us spiritually. They, together with New Testament people of God, this would be the authors in the early church, the authors of the New Testament, should be thought of as God's great spiritual assembly or church. If we're tracking in the scripture. I told you this, this was interesting. This is interesting stuff. We are, and we'll talk more next week about the visible and invisible church, but this would be definitely the invisible part of the church. We didn't just show up in, what year was, what year was this church started? 1915? No. Yeah, 1915. Then all of a sudden just show up and say, hey, you know, let's start a new thing. We'll call it a church. No, we are part here at Wonder ba uh, Ple Pleasant View. We are part of a long, long process of God making himself known to this world. And so don't think of what we've done and what we haven't done. Think about how do we continue this divine process. We are the hands and the feet. We are the visible, physical manifestation of a plan that goes way back. Way back where God has been interacting with his creatures. Moreover, it goes on in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 23 and 24. When you worship, you come to the ecclesia of God, the assembly of God, the church of God, of God's firstborn children. So when we worship, we are part of his firstborn children, the first fruits of God's interaction with mankind, whose names are written in heaven. Do you, do you think about this when we worship? You come to God himself when you worship. He's the judge over all things, the creator of the universe. You come to the spirits of the righteous ones in heaven who have now been perfected. That is believers who have gone before us all the way back as long as people have been believing in God who have gone on to heaven and are in glory. You come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant between God and man, and to the sprinkled blood. Now, this is going back to Leviticus 16, when they go into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the Ark of the Covenant with blood, the purified blood of, um, that would be of a bull and then of a goat, which speaks of forgiveness. And this is very important. This is, the Old Covenant was about um, uh Blessing and curses based on if you are obedient, you get a blessing. If you are disobedient, you get a curse. The new covenant is about the forgiveness of sin, okay? Which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance like the blood of Abel. So when Cain sinned, he was cursed by his sin. That's what that's getting at. So what? Back to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 14 through 22. For Christ brought peace to us. That's a little bit, there is work involved in this Christian life, isn't there? Because we don't just sit on a rock and feel peace. We have to spiritually commune with Christ in the midst of the storms of life to feel that peace. Jesus has made it available. For Christ brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. When in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility separating us. He made peace between us by creating in himself one new people from two groups. That is Jew and Gentile. That, by the way, Jew and Gentile is everybody. You are either Jew or Gentile. So that's, he made peace between the Jews and everybody who's not Jews. Together as one body in Christ, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit 
because of what Christ has done for us. All right? That is the definition of church. What is church? It is those who are reconciled to God and in the meantime, thus reconciled to one another for all time, all the way back and all the way forward. The church, in other words, is who you're going to see in heaven. I think that's a good place to stop for today. Let us pray. God, I can't imagine, I cannot imagine that day when we will be together with you in glory. Lord, help us. Help Pleasant View Baptist Church to reflect heaven and to reflect your kingdom here in Burke County in 2024. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.